Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his charge, and his statues, and his judgments, and his commandments alway. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, and his miracles, and his acts, when he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh the king of Egypt, and unto all his land, and what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord hath destroyed them unto this day. And when he did unto you in the wilderness, until you came into this place, and what he did unto Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Elab, the son of Reban, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their households, and their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession, in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord, which he did. Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong, and go in and possess the land, whether ye go to possess it, and that ye may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord sware unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed, a land that floweth with milk and honey. For the land whither thou go, goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence he came out, where thou showedest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. It shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and has shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, in the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess, gather nations, and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gazim, and the curse upon Mount Ebal. 
and they not on the other side Jordan, by the way where the sun goeth down in the land of Canaanites, which dwell in the companion over against Gilgal, beside the plains of Morah. For you shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and you shall possess it and dwell therein. And you shall observe to do all the statues and judgments which I set before you this day. Amen. Continuing on in the study of uh, Deuteronomy, I've gotten to Deuteronomy chapter 11 thus far. This chapter begins in verse 1 saying, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And something often you do when you come to that statement, therefore, is you wonder to yourself, what is that therefore? What is that therefore, therefore? So you always want to make sure that you're looking back to the context whenever that statement is made, therefore, because it's going to tell you why he's about to make the statement he is. He says, love the Lord thy God. Well, why? Well, because of everything that he has said previous, he's now making the statement, therefore. Previous chapter 10 and verse 14, it says, behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God, is the Lord's thy God. The earth also with all that therein is. Verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Verse 21, He is thy praise, and He is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things, which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Right? These chapter breaks don't often indicate a change of topic, a change of, uh, you know, anything. It's just to carry on. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, therefore, love the Lord the God because of all these things, because he is great, because he is terrible, because he is a mighty God unto you, because the heaven of heavens belong unto him, because he doesn't respect persons, because of all of these great things about him, you ought to love him. And how do you love him? It continues on verse one. It says, and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. The Bible says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And that's how we express our love toward God. God's love came to us indiscriminately. He so loved the world that he gave his son. He loved his creation. He loved us each individually. We show that love back by keeping his commandments. Of course, you have to be saved before he'll recognize the commandments that you do keep. Obviously, any commandments that you do before him, before you're regenerated and reborn, are simply filthy rags in his sight. But those that believe, those that are his children, those that are following after him, ought to show their love by keeping his commandments all way, the Bible says. The charge, keep his charge, what's that mean? That means you watch and you care for the things of God. His statutes, those are his laws, those are his mandates, his judgments. Those are the decisions that the Lord makes for us and toward us. Those commands are the simply what to do's that God gives unto his people. What to do, what to do. Verse 2 it says, and know ye this day, and know ye this day. Now, he's very specifically saying know ye, talking to a very specific people. And we can take this and apply this to ourselves. This isn't for somebody else. When God says, hey, know ye this, just say, hey, I ought to know this. Say that to yourself. Don't think that this ought to be for somebody else. Oh, this is just written to the Jews or the tribulation saints or all the different ways that, that people often dispensationalize the Bible and break it up. No, don't do that. Just simply say, when God says, know ye something, you ought to know that for yourself. He continues on in that verse and says, know ye this day, for I speak not with your children which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm. It continues, and his miracles and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all the land. He says, this isn't for the little ones. Well, you are here this day for such a time as this, and I believe even you here are here today 
living here in Toronto, as it were, for such a time of this. Know ye what God's about to say. Take account of it. Record these things in your heart and believe them and follow after them. Take accountability for what's about to be said. Why? Because he says, these witness the chastening. These have witnessed his greatness. These have witnessed his mighty hand, his stretched out arm, and his miracles that he's done before them. And even in your life, you can probably reflect and think back and when you've seen the chastening hand of God, when you've seen his greatness, his might, his, his stretched out arm towards you, and even miracles in your life. Therefore, you're accountable for what God is about to say because you've witnessed these same things in your life. Now, in the context, he's speaking to those that are about 19 years old and under, okay? Because 20 years, or no, those that were 19 years old and under at the time of the Exodus. Many years have passed, but there would be a group that was still present, that had saw the acts, that knew the truth. Obviously, the very little ones would have not known much things except by secondhand knowledge. But these that were 19 and under at that time are the ones that are now being spoken to directly. And he's saying, hey, take account of this. Be accountable for these truths. I'm not talking to your children. I'm not talking to those generations that have followed after you these many years walking through this wilderness. No, I'm talking to you. Know ye this day. Verse 3 continues on and says, In his miracles and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh the king of Egypt, and unto all his land. Verse 4, And what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, and their, to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord hath destroyed them as it is unto this day. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 5 continues on. It says, And what he did unto you in the wilderness until you came unto this place. And what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the sons of Reuben, of the son, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and her, their households and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of Israel. He's again in this book of repetition, the, the repeating of the law, the second giving of the law into a new generation. He keeps bringing these stories into their minds and reminding them, hey, you've seen chastisement. What was that? Dathan and Abiram, how the earth opened up and swallowed them for their wickedness. You've seen the greatness of God, how he showed himself mighty and strong before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You've seen his mighty hand and his stretched out arm, how he parted the Red Sea and caused the greatest army in the whole world to succumb to that thing when it closed back on them, the sea swallowing them up. You have you are accountable for what you've seen, therefore you're accountable to what you do with that. And here God charges, therefore, since you've seen all these things, love the Lord thy God. Verse 7 continues on, But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. And God has an express purpose of showing you even before your eyes all the great acts that he does. He's not speaking unto somebody else. And we ought not think whenever we hear the preaching or whenever we read the Bible that God is ever speaking to somebody else. We ought to take every word that comes across the pulpit, every word in your morning reading, every word that you even hear spoken in your ear ought to be regarded as if it applies directly to your heart. Know ye this day. This isn't for somebody else. Why were these things written? They were written so that we could see and hear and know and love the Lord our God as a result of all that we have seen. Verse 8, chapter 11, it says, Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land, whether ye go to possess it. There's another therefore. Ask yourself, what is that therefore, therefore? Why is it here? It's because of all of the great things he has just revealed to us. The great acts and the charge to keep all the commandments, expressing our love toward the Lord. What is the benefit to us if we do such things? Well, it says here, we can be strong. They would possess the land. They would prolong their days and they would have provision in the land whether they go to possess it. And I believe God gives the same essential promises to us. Strength and, and, and might to overcome and to withstand hardness. Possession of, of the land and properties, whatever it is. God gives us ability to possess what he has given us. Prolonging of our days. 
long life comes by keeping the commands of the Lord and provision. God will always care for you and give you abundantly above all that you can ask or think, I believe. Keeping God's charges, his statutes, his judgments, and his commands always bring a blessing into our lives. Look at verse 9. And that ye may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Those, those, are, those are things that are, are prized commodities in the land that they live in. Milk and honey are what could come. Great blessing could come to them for simply loving the Lord thy God that loved them first. God's going to go on a tangent and talk a little bit about this land that he swear unto them in verse 10. He says, For the land whither thou goest to possess it is not as the land of Egypt. And sometimes when we're given a promise of God, all we really have in mind that is what we can compare it to is what we've experienced to date. That's why it's so hard for us to imagine what heaven is like because we only have the framework of this world to compare it to. Okay, streets of gold. So we've all maybe seen gold rings or gold jewelry. Just imagine that on the ground. Okay, we can sort of imagine things like that. But the magnitude of it, the beauty of it, the fact there's no lights in it. There's a promised land for us. And God, I think, would say the same thing as he's saying to them going into their promised land about Egypt. He'll say, your promised land, your heavenly Jerusalem is not as the land of Toronto. It is not as the land of Ontario. Whether you go to possess, there is something greater than this. And, and God here is comparing to what they had before, but he's saying it's not the same. There's something different about this promised land. And what are some of these things? He continues on. He says, it's not as the land of Egypt from whence he came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. Okay, so the land of Egypt was one that was lush, that did allow for them to flourish in livestock and flourish in farming and those sort of things. But God records that they sowed their seed and they watered it with their feet. Okay, what does that mean? That means they literally, when they took the seed, they put it on their shoulders and they walked it to where they wanted to place it. Same with the water. They had to bring up the water from the source and take it to where they wanted to place it. They sowed it, they watered it with their foot as they do a garden of herbs. At our house, we've got a little garden of herbs and some tomatoes. And every day I have to pick up the water and take it to the garden to give the plants what they need, to give them what they need to grow and to have strength. Verse 11 says, But the land whither thou goest to possess it, watch this, is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. So they had great labors before. They had great toils before. And now it seems like God is allowing that not only the new source would, instead of being a river or, or, or what a lake or what have you that he would bring it in with, instead of it being the river, now God's saying the rain, the water source is going to be from heaven. He's also saying that the valleys and the hills that are there drinketh that same water. I think they're being given a promise that instead of everything being flat where you have to drag your seed and drag your water and bring it to where it's needed, he's saying that you're going to have a land where there are hills, there are valleys, great rain from heaven. There's going to be irrigation possible. It's going to be allow, It's going to be permissible that the rain would fall and simply go to where it's needed. You're inheriting a land that essentially keeps for itself in a lot of ways. You don't have to anymore haul the water. You don't have to anymore drag the seed necessarily unless you want to plant something different in a different area or whatever. But God says, hey, this land has hills and valleys and drinketh the water of heaven. Interesting parallel here. Your life has hills and valleys, doesn't it? <laughs> Your life has ups and downs and good days and bad days. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean when you go into the promised land, you're going to be free of these things. When you're, when you're in God's will, the Christian can apply the promised land to. You're in God's will. You're in his promises. You're walking in his commands. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll be free of ups and downs, hills and valleys. But what you will have is the rain from heaven. You will have heavenly sustenance, heavenly provision, always on your way as you walk in God's promises, walk in God's promised land. Verse 12 continues and it says this, A land which the Lord thy God careth 
for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. So before they were just simply a cared for people in a land that didn't belong to the Lord, right? Now we understand he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the earth is mine, saith the Lord, he, he says in a few places. But he's given special acknowledgement to a specific land that he says, hey, this is mine. So God's about land ownership, of course. He owns this land. He owns this promised land that he is giving to his people. The Bible says his eyes are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. God's always watching and caring for this land. And no doubt once the people enter in, that same care will be there for them. His eyes are always upon it. Always the Lord is watching these things. Verse 13 and 14, it says, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently. That means carefully and, and watchfully and focused, listening. And not only listening, but absorbing what God is saying. If ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord thy God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Here God promises the first rain. And you know what that rain is for? If you've ever planted a garden, that's the one that germinates. That's the one that sprouts. That's the one that gets that seed to, 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 to die and break open and the life comes out of it. That first rain gets everything kicked off and started. That latter rain, what is this? Well, that's the one that once that seed starts growing up, it allows for it to grow and to get strength and to become fruitful. That latter rain, just as necessary as the first rain. The first rain, just as necessary as the latter rain. And God's promising in that land that he cares for, that he is watching with his eyes upon it, beginning to end. He's providing the rain throughout it. You know what? Here, as individuals and as a church, we need these same things. We need the provision of God we need his eyes to be upon us. We need that first rain. We need that latter rain. We need the rain that gets things started. We need the rain that sustains us once we start growing. Our church needs these things. We need the promise of God and we need all of the special provision that he mentions as we, even as we continue on. The first rain and the latter rain that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. Corn, that's, that's your bread, that's your meat, that's your provision, the sustenance, just the things you daily need in order to keep up energy and keep going. That wine is that which maketh merry. The Bible says that wine brings joy to a man. That, that wine is, is, is the juice. That wine is the, the fruit of the vine that gives strength unto men, makes them joyful, makes them happy. It's, it's the extras that God provides for his people. The oil, do you know what that is? That's a picture of spiritual unction. That's, that's the picture of, of, of the provision of the land that's so abundant that you can even, you can even mash it down and you have this abundant and, 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 and what would it be? It would be... Uh, concentrated goodness that's what that's what the oil is it, it's it's concentrated goodness and provision god talks about the spirit being oil. they anoint um, men's heads with oil when they are sick they anoint people's heads with oil when the time comes for them to do great things in the lord we need this rain from heaven so that we have all of these things corn and wine and oil in our lives and in our ministries we need that rain we need showers of blessing Showers of blessing, we need mercy drops fall around us, but, but thus for the showers we plead. We, we need to plead for those, those showers of blessing coming from God, as the hymn writer says. We're begging God, not just for a drizzle. We want showers of rain. That's what even our, our plants need. That's what the earth needs to drink up. That's what believers need to drink up. Verse 15, it says, And I will send grass in thy field for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be Full. Up to now, it's been mostly vegetation being provided for, but now abundance of vegetation provides the grass even for the beef, even for the meat, even for the flesh that people eat in order that they would feel full. Often vegetables aren't enough. I, I, I would say that for myself. Seeing God's care and His gifts and His blessing abound should bring us to a devotion to Him. When we look around our lives, 
You know, that, that, that song goes, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Sit down one day and, and write and see if you can exhaust all your blessings. We, we have blessings abound even in simple things like, like the breath, the air that we breathe. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and when we look around at His care and His gifts and His blessings, that should bring us to a point where we're actually more devoted to Him. We want to give Him thanks. We want to give Him praise. We want to give Him glory for all that He has done, and most specifically for who He is. That He loved us so much that He would provide and care for us it should be in the forefronts of our mind. Every day we ought to wake up, and the first thought that crosses our mind is, Thank you. Lord, that I even rested through the night and I, I survived the night. You know, some people just die in their sleep. It happens all the time. I, I often fade in and out of this, you know, in the hills and valleys of life. But I, I got to a point and I've gotten to a point in my life at, at seasons where I've asked God to, to make sure that I'm the, he's the first thought in my mind every day. Asking him to, to give me a hymn when I wake up in the morning, even if you need to sing to me in the night so that I'll remember when I wake up. And, and I've been there. You know, sometimes I'm on a hill and I'm, and I'm soaring high, waking up and praising God and my, my feet, my, my knees hitting the ground as soon as I wake up and praying. Of course, sometimes I'm in valleys and I tend to care more for my own things. But ultimately, we ought to be motivated by the blessings of God to give a, a bigger devotion to Him every day. Be more focused on, on, on what God wants from me as opposed to just always trying to get more from God. I want to wake up praising Him. I want to wake up singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. I want to wake up full of the Spirit and just give Him thanks for the rest that I have in a comfortable bed, in a, in a safe country, in a, in a, in a, in a, with a good family. I want to give Him praise and thanks for that. We continue on in verse 16. It says, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and that ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And that's the danger, of course. That's, that's the risk that comes if we don't look to the therefores and understand why we are giving praise to God and why we are seeking diligently after Him. If we lose track of the blessings and gift abound of God, then the danger is we stop taking heed to ourselves. We're deceived into thinking what? Some other idol, some other God, maybe ourselves has provided all these things for us. But God's quick to keep that wayward heart in line. And I'm even thankful for this. Verse 17 says, And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up heaven, and there be no rain, that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. That doesn't seem like something to be thankful, but if you think about it, if God would continue to provide rain, if he would continue to give you fruit, if he would continue to allow you to go in the direction where you are deceived and turn aside and serve other gods, that latter end would be much worse for you than a God that loves you coming down on you with his wrath in order to bring you back to right, in order to bring you back to his will. Think about it. Who would you want deciding what your punishment was for any particular crime? Just some judge that didn't know you or some some or your, your father, perhaps, who loves you and wants what's best for you. Of course, the world will destroy you and that without remedy and that without mercy, but God loves you so much and so even his wrath, when it is kindled, but for a moment is just there to get you back in line, back in his will, back serving him, and back with back receiving of the same blessings that he is promising in the course of these scriptures. Sometimes God's wrath needs to remove us from the good land that we have gained in order for us to understand that that was good land. I, I miss what I had. I, I, I had something wonderful. I had something great. I had the Lord's blessings in my life, and I turned from Him. His wrath falls, and then we suddenly consider, once we're removed from it, oh, that was good. That was a blessing. That, that was great. And then you start to realize what you've done to get to that point. You repent and then you start following back after the things of God. Start getting your devotion right again. I'm even thankful for God's wrath in my life. 
First of all, because it shows me that he still loves me. He still has a plan for me. He still wants to work in my life. And secondly, I'm just so hard-headed that if I didn't have that, I would go down a deep and dark trail, one that would bring me to ruin and one that I could never recover for. Be thankful that God steps in just in the nick of time to show his anger towards you in order that you would repent. Verse 18, it says, Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. So therefore, what? Therefore, because not heeding causes the wrath of God to fall is what he just talked about in the context. Because God wants to care for you, therefore shall ye lay up these my words. And that's the provision that he gives. He gives you a Bible. He gives you his scriptures. He gives you preachers in due season. He gives you songs in your heart that speak spiritual truths. He gives you all of these things. These my words specifically, he says, when he's talking about the King James Bible here for the English speakers, he, he says, these are for you, therefore, so that you don't fall into the wrath of God. The best way to stay on track. In fact, I believe the only way to know God, to follow him, to know what he wants, to, to be in his will is to know these words. Lay them up in your heart and in your soul. Bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. Literally always before thee, the scriptures go. Always before thee, they, they, they guide your life and show you what's right and wrong and keep you on that narrow path. Lay up these words in your heart God wants from us. Remember, this is a know ye this day. This is for all of us who are sitting here. This isn't for your children. This isn't for your family member. This isn't for your spouse. This isn't for a friend of yours. This is for you. Know ye this day these scriptural truths. Know ye this day that God wants the best for you. And the best for you comes when you love him by obeying him and by serving him. You don't want the point where God's wrath falls. We're thankful for it. But hopefully we can avoid it as much as possible by simply laying up these words in our heart and being accountable to our actions as we follow after these words. Showing God love by obeying God and his commands. Verse 19, it says, and this is how it ought to transfer. First we learn. First we lay up. First we study to show ourselves approved unto God. First we get our heart and soul and mind filled up with these things. Then... Verse 19, and you shall teach them your children. Speaking of them, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and that the days of your children in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon earth. I've often heard that the best way to learn something is to be required to teach it. I don't know if anybody's had an experience teaching. Maybe uh, young children, maybe you taught your children certain things. Some, some things get to the point where the best way that you can actually learn them is to be expected to teach them. And if you're a parent, if you're an expectant parent, if, if one day, you know, if, if, you, if you have a, a, an influence on younger siblings, right? Even as Christians, you've got an influence to, and a responsibility to teach new believers that come in. You know, our commission is to get somebody saved. And then, you know what you're expected to do after that? To encourage them on to the things of God. To bring them into the church house. That they would be grown in these things. To follow up on them. To, to look after them. To, to try to get them on the right path. And of course, it doesn't always work out the best. But that's what our, our goal is. And God here says, hey, learn these things. Apply these things. Get them in your heart and in your mind that you may teach others. And the more you teach others, the more you grow in these things. I think people have learned that and experienced that. The more you learn of the gospel, the more easy it is for you to teach it. And the more you teach it, the more you know about the gospel. You begin to learn and to grow and to have these things these truths solid in your life and here this is what God is exhorting his people to do hey lay up these words teach these words be accountable for these words so much that you would be able to influence the next generations you would be able to teach what you have been taught unteachable men will fall unteachable women will fall 
Be teachable. Let the Bible correct you, rebuke you, instruct you. Let the preaching correct you, rebuke you, instruct you. Let your family members who are learned in these scriptural truths rebuke you and correct you and chasten you with these very words. Unteachable men fall every time. We need to have a teachable spirit in our lives. That's what God expects from us. If you're teachable, if you're ready to learn the Bible... What happens? First and foremost, you have protection. Look at verse 22. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourself. God's protection, even clearing the land before they even arrive in it, comes to those who diligently keep all the commandments. You'll have his protection. You'll also have progression. Look at verse 24. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost of the sea coast shall be yours. Sometimes we liken the overcoming and the conquering of the promised land to the Christian life. Every place that you step, every journey that you go on, everywhere you walk, you ought to be progressing in the Christian life. Day by day, with each passing moment, strength that I find to meet each trial here. That's what our life ought to represent. Protection of God as he goes before you and progression and growth. Also, there ought to be a reputation which proceeds you. Look at verse 25. There shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon as he hath said unto you. The reputation of that man is a Bible believer. That man is a Christian. Don't mess with him. His God will mess you up. That ought to be the reputation that goes before God's godly people. And how do they stay godly? Just love him. How do you love him? Hear his commands, yield to his command, obey his command, and seek after him in your life. Let his word be as frontlets before your eyes, to the end that you even write it upon the doors of your house, so that it's always there, and you're always ready to absorb it and to heed it. We ought to have God's protection. It comes by obeying him and being teachable by the word. We ought to be progressing in the Christian life. That comes by being teachable and obeying God's word. We ought to have a reputation of being God-fearing people, and that comes from obeying and being teachable by God's word. But there is always, there's a choice to make. Look at verse 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. And I love using this illustration in, in soul winning. Showing people your hands and saying, I put before you this day life and death a blessing and a curse. Choose life, right? That's the illustration that God constantly and repeatedly gives to his people. A blessing, verse 27, if you obey the commandment of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. Verse 28, and a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day and go after other gods which ye have not known. It's very clear. Blessing comes from obedience to the word. Curse comes from disobedience to the word. And there's a next step to disobedience is that eventually you're just serving other gods. Eventually you will serve your own flesh. Eventually you will serve sin, Satan. You will, you will serve everybody but the living God. Sin, Satan, and self. That's, that's the three S's that we often bring, that we often will serve in place of God. Verse 29, it says, And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land, whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim, and the curse upon Mount Ebal. We're going to see this once we get to Deuteronomy 27 and 28. They literally, though God's saying it now, there's a blessing and a curse, they're going to act out the blessing and curse upon these two mountaintops opposite a valley. And the blessings are going to be read out. And the curses are going to be read out. It's a really interesting story. God gives them a working illustration of what he's now trying to teach them. Verse 30 says, Are they not on the other side, Jordan, by the way where the sun goeth down, in the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in the champaign over against Gilgal, besides the plains of Mori? 
For ye shall pass over Jordan and go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and the judgments which I set before you this day. Ye shall observe to do these things. It's your choice to make always. Are you going to love God? Or are you going to love everything else? Believe there's no middle ground. Either you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, or you're just going to love something else, someone else. You cannot serve two masters. God's always going to bring this to highlight, especially in this chapter. He's telling millions of people, serve me or utter destruction will will fall upon you. Serve me or eventually you will go after gods. Gods which you have not known. Gods which you have to this day not even conceived of. They will become your masters. Promised land is before you. Diligently keep these commandments. Learn them so much that you can teach them. Be obedient unto my word and thus this day know ye I'm not talking to somebody else. This day, God says he wants you to love him. And that's what he expects from us. It's simple. It seems so simple, right? He loved you first that you might love him as well. I'm thanking you, Father, now for this day, Lord.